Our speaker this evening is senior editor at the Augustan Institute and editor of the St. Austin Review. A native of England, Joseph Pierce is an internationally acclaimed author of many books, including The Quest for Shakespeare, Tolkien, Man and Myth, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, and C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church. His world-recognized biographies have been translated into nine other languages, in addition to hosting two television series about Shakespeare on EWTN, he's also written and presented documentaries on Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. We're thrilled to welcome back to the Institute for the third time, Mr. Joseph Pierce. Good evening. It's very good to be here. Um, it is my third time um, giving a talk or a lecture for the Institute, but it's my first time in the flesh. <laughs> and I'm an old-fashioned sort of person, uh, and uh, there's nothing like uh, incarnating a relationship by actually being on the ground with real people you can actually see and shake hands with and hug. So, uh, so it's actually good to be here uh, in this capacity. So thanks so much for coming. Um, uh, I would just make one thing perfectly clear from the beginning, just to make one thing absolutely clear. I am the only person in this room without an accent. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to understand you. <laughs> so speak slowly during the Q&A, okay? And I'll try to speak slowly, uh, not, to go, not get too carried away. Well, our, our topic this evening uh, is... Um, Oscar Wilde, uh, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde. Um, and my motives for writing my book, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, were because it seemed to me that everybody had missed the point about Wilde. Um, the point about Wilde ultimately is that uh, he is uh, one of the great writers of the late Victorian era um, and uh, a great convert to the Catholic faith who turned his back on a life of sin. But that's not the way he tends to be seen. So in my uh, preface to uh, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, I say this, and as I say it better here than I'm, I try to garble it, I'm going to permit me to read one page of my book. The rest is available very, very cheaply at the back. <laughs> so the problem stems from an inability to see Wilde except through the lens of either Puritan or Prurient motives. The Prurient see Wilde as a subversive hero who undermines traditional values. For this school of thought, his value is not primarily in his art, but in his licentious life encapsulated in the lurid title of Melissa Knox's study of Wilde as Wilde's long and long and lovely suicide. Against the prurient is counterposed the Puritan, who believes that Wilde's work lacks value because of his immoral life. The most extreme example of the Puritan school of thought was St. John Irvin, whose conclusion to his appraisal of Wilde, published in 1952, is particularly scathing. I'm going to quote it. Wilde came into the world with a small talent and made little of it. He did worse than that. He denied his principles by his practice. I managed to get some chili on my jacket here. My wife will not be surprised <laughs> when I've removed the evidence. <laughs> One thing I have in common with G.K. Chesterton is like, it's impossible, I find it impossible to eat a meal without some of it ending up on my clothing. So <laughs> as a traditionalist, I'm pleased I managed to keep the tradition going. So where, where, where were we? In the middle of something important, obviously. I'll start from the top. Wilde came into the world with a small talent and made little of it. He did worse than that. He denied his principles by his practice. He cast such pearls as he had before swine and then wallowed with the swine at the troughs in the sty. He was a flippant man who turned high matters to Bibbler's jests, 
and would not forego a witticism to spare a friend's wound. A brawler in the temple may be sincerely affirming a faith, but a man who titters in the temple and is flippant about his faith is a recusant who denies without any affirmation in the denial. The steward who hid his talent in a napkin was cursed and condemned. But what punishment is fitting for the man who takes his gift from God and drops it in the mire? That was the sin committed by Oscar Wilde. It was the sin against the Holy Ghost. Doesn't get much more damning than that. He's actually saying, actually saying that the steward who hid his talent in a napkin was cursed and condemned. No, but what punishment is fitting for the man who takes his gift from God and drops it in the mind? In other words, hell is too good for Oscar Wilde. He's got to find, God's got to invent somewhere worse for him. So here's my comment in the preface on both those viewpoints, the prurient and the puritan. The, pur the prurient and the puritan are both blinded by their bias. To one, Wilde is a war cry. To the other, he is a warning. One betrays him with a kiss, the other with a curse. It is a choice between Judas and the Pharisee. George Bernard Shaw, in his preface to the 1938 edition of Frank Harris's biography of Wilde, admitted that he had, quote, somewhat pharisaically, end quote, summed up Wilde's last days in Paris as those of, quote, an unprofitable drunkard and swindler, end quote. Yet, he argued, those of Wilde's admirers who had objected to this description of their hero had forgotten that Wilde's, that, quote, Wilde's permanent celebrity belongs to literature and only his transient notoriety to the police news, end quote. It is a fact that is forgotten by Wilde's detractors as much as by his admirers. In both cases, he is condoned or condemned in accordance with the personal prejudices of those sitting in judgment. He is presumed innocent or guilty before the evidence is heard. Both sides pontificate before pondering Wilde's own words and come to conclusions before hearing and comprehending the arguments of the case. They are too busy casting stones at Wilde or each other to remember that the subject of their passion was first and foremost an artist who expressed his deepest secrets about himself in his art. We are all in the gutter, says Lord Darlington in Lady Windermere's fan, but some of us are looking at the stars. To look for Wilde in the gutter, whether to wallow with him in the mire, or to point the finger of self-righteous scorn, is to miss the point. Those wishing a deeper understanding of this most enigmatic of men should not look at him in the gutter, but with him at the stars. So that's how I set the scene for my biography and my study of Oscar Wilde, in which I endeavor to remove the masks. Oscar Wilde was aware of masks. Um, he's aware of masks, and masks can do two things. They can reveal or they can conceal. So, um, for instance, the sacraments are signs. In other words, a sign is, is if you like, a mask that points to something else, but it's a, it's a sign that actually reveals something. But a mask also can obviously conceal. So, Let's look at Wilde, and let's look at the evidence now. Wilde said that epigraph, which I used to start my book, at the, in the preface to De Profundis. He said, you knew what my art was to me. The great primal note by which I had, I had revealed, first myself to myself, and then myself to the world. The real passion of my life, the love to which all other loves were as marsh water to red wine. So what I attempt to do in my book is to look at Wilde's art, and I do it 
deliberately, now I'm not going to start off by talking about his Catholicism, though we get there, and in fact it's a thread that runs through the whole book, and it's going to be a thread that runs through my whole talk, as you shall see. But I want this book, this book was published in the UK by HarperCollins. I wanted it to be read by people who admired Wilde because they were living a homosexual lifestyle, by people who admired Wilde for all the wrong reasons as well as those that admire him for the right reasons. So, as Tolkien would say, uh, and Lewis would say, you have to get past those watchful dragons. So my book, uh, in the fact it was published by HarperCollins, uh, and you could buy it on all the secular bookstores, hopefully achieve that. But the thread that connects Wilde's life from his undergraduate years to his death is his love affair with the Catholic Church, and that's going to be the primary <coughs> focus of the talk. A lifelong love affair, and it must be said, Wilde was not on many occasions, a very faithful lover. But he could never fully turn his back and walk away because it was a love which basically made sense of himself, as we shall see. So th those words I just read were from De Profundis. Now what's important about De Profundis is that it's the only thing that Wilde wrote um, that he was not, not writing with a public in mind. So when you're writing something, you have an audience. And for someone like Wilde that's, that's in, interested in presenting false perceptions of himself, you have to remove the mask to actually work out what he's actually really trying to say. But De Profundis was written while he's in prison to Lord Alfred Douglas, the young man with whom he was having the homosexual affair that led to Wilde's downfall. And during the research, my research for the book, I went to the British Library and uh, got access to the original handwritten manuscript by Oscar Wilde. Now those of you that have read De Profundis will know that it's a rather strange work because it sort of oscillates between waxing lyrical uh, about the beauties of Catholic civilization, of the Renaissance, of Dante, um, and then words of anger about, against himself and against Lord Alfred Douglas for the sort of lifestyle they had descended into. Now when you look at the manuscript, what's very interesting is that when Wilde's writing about Catholicism and about Western civilization, his, his handwriting is neat and tidy, very legible. And then obviously something comes into his mind about how he threw all this away because of this lifestyle and he gets angry and the, 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 the words get much larger. He's obviously writing quickly and, and, uh, and he's just venting his spleen with an audience of one, the, the man with whom he had the relationship that led to his downfall. In other words, no masks. All the masks are, re are, are removed. This is wild, stripped to the bone. Of course, the, the, the title De Profundis comes, as I'm sure you know, from the title of one of the, actually two, of the penitential psalms. It's a work which is most, is most honest, is most private, is most broken, uh, and the one where, there, as I said, there are no masks. What's interesting about it as a work, however, is that when, um, yeah, Andy's taller than I am, that's better. Um, but what's interesting, um, when it was published after Wilde's death, all of the angry bits against Lord Alfred Douglas were edited out. So the work reads like a, you know, uh, the work of, 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 of pious, um, uh, a pious Catholic convert, basically, about the, the wonders of Catholicism and of Western civilization which is only half the story. However, so if you like, that's the Puritan. Well, we'll get rid of all the sordid stuff and just present the world's best side, okay? And we'll, uh, we'll brush the bad side under the carpet. But then in 2000, year 2000, back in England, I was still living in England, there was a centenary celebration uh, to commemorate the death of Oscar Wilde uh, in London on the South Bank and um, I gave a talk, but Corin Redgrave, who some of you might know, famous actor, the brother of Vanessa Redgrave, practicing homosexual and a communist, um, but a very good actor, no one would deny that, 
Um, he did a one-man show as Wild, and the words were all from De Profundis. But all of the waxing lyrical about the Catholic Church is removed. And only the anger against Lord Alfred Douglas remains. So that all that's left is the dark side of Wild, which is now being celebrated. And the, sort of the, the, the side of Wild which was not uh, wallowing in the gutter but looking at the stars is completely expunged. This was the problem. Now in De Profundis, Oscar Wilde refers to his homosexuality as his, quote, pathology, his sickness. Now, there are parts of the world where Oscar Wilde, were he alive today, would be thrown in prison for saying that. Because there are parts of the world now where it's illegal to suggest that homosexuality is in some sense pathological. You go north of the border here, for instance, my own country, I know a, a Franciscan friar in my own country has been threatened with imprisonment for handing out leaflets, flyers in public, um, warning against the, the uh, sin of homosexuality. Um, and even in California, in this country, it's now actually illegal to advertise any uh, therapy, anything therapeutic uh, for homosexuality. So Wilde would be, in modern language, considered a homophobe. So the fact that he's held up by the pride movement as a martyr for their cause is quite frankly perverse. He's certainly not and should not be seen as a, a so-called gay icon. He rejected the lifestyle as something which was sick. Now, but the worst thing about Wilde, as far as the modern world is concerned, is the fact that he did the ultimate act of treachery to, to pride, which is, of course is the worst of sins. But anyway, just to be a little bit, of, uh, a little bit controversial, because no talk's fun unless there's some controversy. You know that St. Paul says that obviously the greatest of the virtues is love, right? It's charity. And heaven forbid that I would disagree with St. Paul, because I'd be a heretic, wouldn't I? Exactly. But, and I'm not disagreeing with him, by the way, um, that, uh, but the greatest of the sins is pride. It's the sin of Satan. It's the sin of Adam and Eve. And if the greatest of sins, pride is basically the sin where we self-deify, where we make ourselves God. And then once you've made yourself God, of course, you make up your own rules. And all the other sins are permitted. So pride is the father of all the other six deadly sins. It's the worst. The first and the worst. Well, the antidote and the antithesis of the worst of sins is humility. And I would therefore say that humility is also, along with love, um, uh, the greatest of the virtues. And I would also say, by the way, that they're completely inseparable. So it, only uh, uh, a Pharisee is going to quibble too much about it. Um, but let's St. Thomas Aquinas, because this all comes into this, looking at the stars. St. Thomas Aquinas makes it clear that all perception begins, all perception of the truth begins with humility. If you read the Summa, humility leads to gratitude. If we see things with humility, we will have gratitude for the things we see. If we have a gratitude for the things we see, our eyes are open to wonder. And it's only through wonder that we are moved to contemplation. And it's only through contemplation that we reach that state of dilatatio, dilation, the opening of the mind and the soul into the fullness of the real. So in St. Thomas Aquinas, right, the five fivefold process of, of perception begins with humility. Humility, gratitude. Gratitude, wonder. Wonder, contemplation. Contemplation, dilatatio, dilation, opening. So humility 
is something that ultimately we need to learn, and we need to learn it from Wilde, who learned it the hard way. Because Wilde was received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed, and that, as I said, for the advocates of pride, is the worst sin he could have done, to be received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed. And of course, so many of them deny it. Never happened. It's all Catholic propaganda. So, of course, the first thing one has to do is to look at the evidence. There were only three people in the room. The man who was dying, Oscar Wilde, who was compus mentis, he knew what he was doing and saying and thinking. His best friend, Robert Ross, a young Canadian, well, not quite so young by this stage, but uh, the man who's generally believed to have been the person that introduced Wilde to the homosexual lifestyle at Wilde's home while his wife and two young sons were asleep upstairs. But Robert Ross actually converts to Catholicism, after, obviously subsequent to that, and is one of the very, very few people that stay true to Wilde when he's an outcast. Fairweather friends obviously desert you. And Robert Ross was the only one there during Wilde's final illness in poverty in Paris. And it was Robert Ross that asked Wilde whether he needed a priest, or whether he wanted a priest. Um, and when Wilde assented to that, he went and got the priest. So the third person in the room is a priest whose name was Father Cuthbert Dunn. Now, Robert Ross and, and Father Dunn did not know each other before. They never met each other ever again afterwards. Many years later, and years apart and separately, they both wrote their own accounts of what happened on the night of Wilde's being received into the church and receiving the last rites of the church prior to his death, and both stories completely and utterly accord with each other. So the evidence is overwhelming that Wilde was received into the church shortly before his death. And that was basically the logical and theological conclusion to his life in both senses of the word conclusion. It was the end of his life, but it was also the conclusion that he'd reached many years earlier, but for reasons of cowardice and, uh, and other reasons of pride, uh, he did not f follow where the logic and theology led him. So let's go, let's, let's go back over that then. Oh, by the way, I want to say one other thing as well. I, I, gave a talk, I gave a talk on Oscar Wilde once a few years back, maybe three or four years ago, two or three years ago, at the annual conference of Courage. And I don't know if you've heard of Courage, but Courage is the Catholic apostolate for those struggling with same-sex attraction. And there's, and there's a, a, a sister sort of thing that's part of it called Encourage, which is for the, the parents and, and siblings of those struggling with same-sex attraction. So anyway, so I, I gave this talk, and someone, a, a lady during the Q&A, was outraged. Uh, not so much with me, but with Oscar Wilde. <laughs> and outraged with Oscar Wilde, because how dare he be received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed, right, shortly before he dies, after living such a disgusting life. You know, you, are you telling me he's going straight to heaven? You know, I thought about saying, well, would you, rather he, would you rather he go to hell? But I didn't. But I did say, you know, one of the beautiful things about the Catholic faith is the belief in purgatory. That yes, if someone is received into the Catholic Church on their deathbed and their sins are forgiven, they're going to go to heaven. That doesn't mean they will not have to suffer for the suffering they've caused to themselves and others through their own pride and sinfulness. Part of God's justice and his mercy is that we should know who we are. And we should know what we've done. And I think the purgatorial experience basically will be that knowledge. Before we see face Christ to Christ, faith, faith, Christ face to face, please God, we will know hopefully all the good things we've done and the positive uh, consequences of our virtuous deeds, but also how we've hurt people. And perhaps how we've hurt people we don't even know by things that we've done. And the harm that did to them and to others. 
In other words, the sort of uh, domino effect of sin. Well, that's going to hurt. Because if you're not going to hell, you love Christ. And knowing the harm you've done to others, your neighbor, and knowing the role you played in nailing him to the cross is going to hurt. And if, if you're in love with Christ, you're going to welcome that suffering. Wild welcome that suffering, and I'll get to that. Okay, so the lifelong love affair. Wilde was first attracted to the Catholic Church when he was an undergraduate at Trinity College in Dublin. He started to go to Mass, started to have conversations with, with Catholics and Catholic priests and um, having conversations about theology. Some of his undergraduate friends were converts. Now his father was horrified. And in order to save Wild, his son, from a fate worse than death, being coming a papist, he plucked him out of Trinity College, Dublin, and had, had him transferred to Oxford. Now, if any of you know anything about 19th century history, that's like saying getting someone from the frying pan and throwing them into the fire if you want to avoid them becoming Catholic. <laughs> of course, the Oxford movement in the Church of England was uh, the Catholicizing, if you like, of the Anglican Church, and the leader of the Oxford movement was a certain John Henry Newman, whose influence at Oxford was phenomenal. In 1866, uh, Newman was received in the church in 1845. In 1866, he received Gerard Manny Hopkins into the church, arguably the greatest poet of the 19th century, who became a Jesuit priest. That's not that long before Wilde arrives as an undergraduate. Ten, ten or so years later. In fact, Hopkins, I have too many tangents here, Hopkins may well have been serving as a curate uh, at St. Aloysius Church in Oxford when Wilde was attending daily mass there. Because, of course, Wilde goes to Oxford and he is not healed of his Roman fever, as he calls it himself, uh, but actually gets a very bad dose of it. And most of his friends are either converts or on the path to conversion. He's up uh, deep in the night, into the night, um, uh, discussing theology. There's also two, Wilde's an aesthete, remember, a lover of beauty. And there were two views of the Renaissance that were very powerful and palpable in Wilde's day in Oxford. Two great Renaissance scholars, I mean, whom you might have, have heard, John Ruskin and Walter Pater. And they were there at the same time. Ruskin was the older, more established, and Pater was the new kid on the block. John Ruskin's view of the Renaissance was that uh, it was summed up in his words that Venice had changed from being a medieval virgin to being a Renaissance Venus. In other words, what happened was to use two adjectives related to this, a venereal, as in Venus, or erotic, as in eros, a venereal or erotic fall, okay, that, that, that had taken place. Now, Walter Pater, in commenting upon Ruskin's view of the Renaissance, and, you know, this is the late Renaissance as opposed to the early Renaissance, um, Pater's view was he agreed with that, but Pater's view was that it was a good thing. In other words, that the decadence was a healthy decadence, that it was a, a fortunate fall from the Virgin to the Venus. So these two views were at war. Wilde was fascinated by Walter Pater's view and considered it ultimately later, looking back on his life in De Profundis, as something which was poisonous. But he took very strongly John Ruskin's side. He actually became a disciple of Ruskin and went out. Ruskin would lead men out to do some good works in the countryside, digging ditches for the poor, what have you. Wilde actually joined some of those. He was a disciple of Ruskin. So that's that was his position. As regards the Catholic Church's politics, because yes, there's always politics in the Catholic Church. Surprise, surprise. Now, in the 19th century, when Wilde was an undergraduate, it was between the ultramontane wing of the church and the 
inopportunist wing of the church. Now, for those who don't know what that is, in England, the ultramontanes were led by Cardinal Manning, and the inopportunists were led by a certain Cardinal Newman. Now, the inopportunists thought that the promulgation in the First Vatican Council, the papal infallibility, they agreed with it doctrinally, but thought it was an inopportune time to actually promulgate it. That's the inopportunists. Whereas the ultramontanes, though, that, that go beyond the mountain, in other words, beyond the mountains, beyond the Alps, all right, to Rome, the, the pro-Romans, were all for it. So they were, if you like, the trad, the rad trad conservative wing of the church. And Pius IX, Pio Nono, was, of course, a very hard line, Pope Benedict XVI type pope. So what's interesting is where did Oscar Wilde fit into this political spectrum? Well, he had two portraits on the wall of his rooms in Oxford. One of the Pope, Pope Pius IX, and the other of Cardinal Manning. He was a rad trad. Now, I'm not going to get involved, by the way, in any of who was right or wrong. Obviously, I love both Newman and Manning, and Newman's beatified, right? No problem. <laughs> right, just saying, you know, what sort of Catholic was Wilde? He was a serious, no-nonsense, conservative Catholic. And discuss these things. 1878, he visits Father Sebastian Bowden at Brompton Oratory in London um, to have an a interview, a meeting with him to discuss his reception into the church. There's a marvelous long letter from Father Bowden basically nailing Wilde's problem, his weakness, his lack of courage, his lack of being able to follow through with his convictions, and the danger involved in putting the world before God. It's a beautiful letter. I, mean, I, I couldn't read it, but we, we obviously have a limited amount of time here. Father Bowden and Wilde arrange to have a second meeting. Wilde gets cold feet and sends Father Bowden a bouquet of flowers in his absence. A fatal, fatal, fatal moment. Wilde says himself, when he got out of prison, that if he had defied his father, and the reason for it is his father had threatened to disinherit him if he became a Catholic. So instead of a future which had been relatively comfortable, his father was a very wealthy lawyer, instead of a very comfortable future, he'd have a, probably a future of penury. So you know, let's be fair to Wilde, that's a real issue, right? If, if we were actually, make, make that choice were made to us, yeah, you can carry on being a Catholic, but you're going to be close to homeless for the rest of your life. Some of us might think twice. But nonetheless, he said if he had defied his father and become a Catholic, then the whole of the homosexual adventure in his life would never have happened. In my book, I, there's, I talk about Wilde's first great love, um, uh, a, a young lady called Florence Balcom. I only mention him passing here because it's interesting. I, think that, I don't think Wilde's a great poet. I think he's a great playwright, and I think his novel, his one novel, is marvelous, and um, I love some of his uh, fairy stories. But I don't think he's a great poet. But I, for me, his best poetry is actually love poetry written to this young lady who would never marry. The young lady would actually leave him. Her name's Florence Balcom, like an Irish lass, as well as, of course, Irish. She leaves him and uh, 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 not long after marries a certain Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula. Um, so, uh, yeah, Wilde is jilted by a woman who marries the author of Dracula. Just a piece of stuff to throw in there. But then Wilde goes on and meets Constance, uh, whom he marries. They have two children. And I, I, I try to show him, not that Constance is, is, is a saint uh, by any means, but I do show in my book, I think, that she is the victim. And for all the people that try to make of Wilde a hero, they, they, they sort of airbrush his wife and children out of the picture, as all advocates of a sinful lifestyle tend to do. They, they don't want people to actually see the dirty underbelly of the consequences of the lifestyle. 
And she said, it, however much her life was ruined, she had to leave England, live in exile. Uh, his two children changed their names because just being associated with Wilde was making their life hell. But she said, Wilde is weak, not wicked. That's a great words of charity from a woman whose own life was destroyed by her husband's infidelity. Now, Wilde on his honeymoon read, they went, they went on the honeymoon to Paris, and Wilde read a newly released novel on their honeymoon by a, a, a novelist called Joris Carl Huismans. Um, a decadent novelist. Now, call me strange, but I think that you'd hope Wilde had better things to do on his honeymoon <laughs> than to read uh, a new novel, however good it is, right? But this particular novel is called Arabu, it means against the grain or against nature, and in this novel, the, 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 the protagonist in the novel is so stinking rich, he can and does indulge every single sensual appetite there's nothing he doesn't do. It's a catalog of sin. And yet it ends with a cri de coeur, a cry from the heart of a desperate man to a God he doesn't even know is there. In other words, where does a life of self-indulgence lead? To misery and despair. Many sinful Practices become sinful habits, and those habits are addictive. And an addict is not someone who's happy. An addict is a slave. This man at the end, and of course, Huisman's point is clear. Huisman has lived this decadent lifestyle. The French decadence. Huisman's next novel is called La Bas, Down There. And it's down there as in hell. And again, in this, the protagonist goes deeper and deeper into the underworld ending up at a black mass in the world of the satanic and the demonic. But that's, a, that's the first of a trilogy of novels. In the third of the novels, the second novel is called En Route, On, on the Way, and the third novel is called La Cathedral, The Cathedral, His Conversion. Huismas is himself, spends the final years of his life in a monastery. And this is a pattern, which when we come to the English decadence of whom Wilde is the godfather. So Wilde falls in love with French literature. He falls in love particularly with the French decadence. And he becomes the father of the English decadence. But th we can actually see here a pattern. Because Charles Baudelaire, who's the father of the French decadence, wrote a volume of poetry called Les Fleurs de Mal, the flowers of sickness or the evil flowers or the sick flowers. And a critic said to him, or wrote about him in the press, that after that volume of poetry, there's a simple choice left to Baudelaire. He has a choice between the end of the barrel of a gun, suicide, or the foot of the cross. Baudelaire confessed later that was the one critic who understood exactly where he was. And Baudelaire, like Wilde, although earlier, is received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed. Paul Verlaine, the French decadent poet, deserted his wife for a homosexual lover. And when, he, when his homosexual lover de deserted him for a younger homosexual lover, he shot his homosexual lover and was sent to prison. He didn't kill his homosexual lover. Um, I think he shot him in the leg or the foot or something. His homosexual lover, by the way, is, uh, is another famous French poet called Rambo not as in the big muscular Rambo of the Hollywood movies, right? Um, spelled differently. Um, but Paul Verlaine has a conversion experience in prison. He's received into the Catholic Church, and when he comes out of prison, publishes a volume of verse called Sagesse, meaning wisdom. A convert, as Baudelaire is a deathbed conversion. Huisman's a convert. So there's a pattern in these French decadence, which is echoed in the English decadence. So Wilde becomes the, uh, the father of the English decadence. Now, I, I'm going to show briefly Wilde at his worst here. I talk, talk about this in the book. He wrote uh, uh, some, something called The Decay of Lying. He went through a phase where he's trying to justify to himself his desertion of his wife and children, his desertion of his Catholic 
beliefs and his Catholic understanding of the cosmos for this sordid lifestyle he's chosen. So he's, he's, he's actually involved in something which is, could, should be called double think. Those of you who read George Orwell's 1984, you know, the holding of two mutually incompatible positions at the same time simultaneously. Same time simultaneously, did I say that? <laughs> so I'm talking about this dialogue between two people, right? Uh, and, and it's not a dialogue because the, the decadent gets all the best lines and the other one's just purely passive. So Gilbert's insistence on the superiority of sin may have been linked psychologically to Wilde's adoption of a sexually licentious lifestyle. If, like Dorian Gray, Wilde was determined to continue sinning, it was far easier and more psychologically comforting to scoff at the concept of sin than to admit that he was a sinner. Stubbornly unwilling to amend his life, it became necessary to amend his critical approach to morality. If conventional morality did not conform with the self-image, it must be reinvented in the image of the self. Definition of that, of course, is pride. If repentance was undesirable, sin must be sanctified. If innocence was thought to be impossible, guilt must be abolished. Wild like Dorian Gray had nothing but his conscience to overcome, and this singular essay may have been an attempt to achieve this. The singular approach, once adopted, produced some singularly peculiar results. Art, Gilbert insists, is a passion. And as, such, and as such cannot be narrowed into a theological dogma. Yet the passively compliant earnest does not come back with the obvious riposte that it is impossible to understand or fully appreciate religious art, its passion, without understanding the dogma that underpins and inspires it. In fact, the same is true of all art, not just the religious. All art is the product of the metaphysical presuppositions on the part of the artist, though expressed subconsciously. Similarly, Gilbert maintains, quote, there is nothing sane about the worship of beauty. It is too splendid to be sane, end quote. He then declares that art and ethics must be kept absolutely distinct and separate. Quote, when they are confused, chaos has come again. End quote. Yet, if insanity is splendid, what is wrong with chaos? Again, the question remains unasked and therefore conveniently unanswered. There is no sin except stupidity, says Gilbert, and one longs in vain for earnest reply, no, there is no stupidity except sin. The ensuing debate would have been of considerable interest, but the lamentable reticence of Gilbert's disciple ensures the stultification of further stimulating discussion. Throughout this curiously contorted essay, Wilde is not so much grappling in the sense of one who is wrestling with, with or for the truth as groping in the sense of one trying to find the light in a darkened room or as one clutching at straws. In muddying the waters of the self, he seems to have muddled the working of the mind. So this is where Wald was at his worst, which is also, by the way, his worst work. Because his best work, his plays, uh, are profoundly moral. The importance of being, being honest, we might... Honest? <laughs> the importance of being honest is important, too. The importance of being earnest, um, you know, we might call that ethically neutral but good fun. But the rest of them all basically Christian moral plays, um, where Wald shows sympathy for the sinner, but the sinner repents. He has no sympathy for the Pharisee, nor any sympathy for the decadent. So, for instance, uh, in uh, A Woman of No Importance, the decadent character, the iconoclast, is called Lord Illingworth. You can work out Illworth. In the picture of Dorian Gray, we see Wilde's great moral masterpiece, and it's very similar to those decadent masterpieces of Huisman's, La Barre en Route and La Cathedral, that basically... Dorian Gray has a pact with the devil that the picture will, st will grow old while he stays young. And what the picture does, it doesn't just grow old, it reflects back the horrific reality of, wild, oh, sorry, of Dorian Gray's soul. The picture is a mirror, a mirror of the soul. And at the end of it, Dorian Gray comes close to repenting on several occasions. At the end... He decides all he has to do is kill the picture, destroy the picture. 
But of course the picture is the mirror of his soul. And when he tries to destroy the picture, he's, tries to, he's trying to kill his conscience, and in trying to kill his conscience, he kills himself. Profoundly, in fact, The Picture Dorian Gray, as dark as it is, is one of the great Christian novels. I teach it regularly. All right, coming towards a conclusion here. When Wald gets out of prison, he writes a long poem called The Ballad of Reading Jail, in which he, he, the poem contains some of my favorite lines in literature because they encapsulate some of the deepest truths. But God's eternal laws are kind and break the heart of stone. Because how else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in. Wald's heart had to be broken because it was made of stone and he knew it. As with Alexander Solzhenitsyn who thanked God for prison because it opened his eyes to reality, Oscar Wilde had the same experience, reading the whole of Dante's Divine Comedy in the original Latin. And as I said, Wilde's conversion from this decadent, this decadent moment was not an exception, but in many ways a rule. The English decadence, Wilde was the leader, but the, all these young acolytes, so, um, uh, John Gray, who was alleged to be the physical model for Dorian Gray, beautiful young youth in other words, went on not only to convert to Catholicism, but went on to become a Catholic priest. Um, Lionel Johnson, the decadent poet, was a convert to Catholicism. Ernest Dowson, uh, a decadent poet, was a convert to Catholicism. Ernest Dowson, by the way, I, read a, I, read, I, no, I edited a book called Poems Every Catholic Should Know. And there's a poem in there called Extreme Unction. In other words, in the last rites of the church. That's the heart of a, of a, a, a broken heart seeking forgiveness for a, a desolate lifestyle. A beautiful poem. Even Lord Alfred Douglas, Wald's nemesis, becomes a Catholic. Aubrey Beersley, the decadent artist, becomes a Catholic. So you're probably thinking, oh, well, my word, what sort of institution am I a member of, right? <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, he said, the Catholic Church is for saints and sinners. The Anglicans will do for everybody else. <laughs> but I want to finish with, that, with an analogy of another great convert to the faith, um, Malcolm Muggeridge, because I think his, his response to a journalist's question um, is it really n nails on the head what we're trying to say about Oscar Wilde's position here. Muggeridge was received into the church when he was 78 years old. Prior to that, he was a serial fornicator. Uh, he, he, he cheated on his wife multiple times and as he said himself it was a miracle that his marriage survived so when he's received into the catholic church as a 78 year old a cynical young journalist says to malcolm mugridge well mr mugridge you've had a good life and you've had a good time in your good life you've had a lot of fun now that you're too old to have that sort of fun anymore, you become a Catholic and now are preaching to the younger people that they shouldn't have the fun that you had. Can you say in all honesty that you regret your life of fun? And Mugridge responded, I regret all my sins, especially insofar as they've hurt others, which is a perfect response, thinking of his wife, that fun comes at a price. He said, but in another way, I can't regret the path. Because if the path has led me 
to the foot of the cross, I have to be thankful for the path. How else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierce, uh, especially for modeling for us this art of not simplifying a complicated person. Is Oscar Wilde considered an icon of the pride movement? And if so, what's a good quote from Oscar Wilde to uh, mention to them? Uh, the answer is yes, although I think thanks to you know, work such as mine, and not only mine, not but, you know, but work where people are actually showing the true wild, less so than he used to be, because people realize he's a dangerous weapon to use, because you know, it's like shooting a gun that's going to backfire on you. Um, so the obvious the fact you can mention the fact, describe his own homosexuality as a pathology, that one word from De Profundis, I mean, that's going to stop them using him for that purposes. But really, you know, that if, you want, if you're having a friendly conversation, and, and let's try if possible, okay? Um, I, that, that line I used from Wilde, um, from one of his plays, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. All right? So the basically, you know, that we're men, uh, and you can even use this to talk about the, the Greek word for, 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 for man, for humanity, anthropos, he who looks up. So that I, I sometimes say that the, 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 the animal grazes, man gazes, all right? We're meant to gaze. We're meant to look beyond the gutter to the stars and, and lead the conversation in that direction if you can have a friendly conversation, okay? If not, then you just say, God's eternal laws are kind and break the heart of stone. Uh, how else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in, smile at them sweetly and shake the dust from your sandals and move on. Hello, Mr. Pierce. Thank you for your talk. And I was reading a, a picture of Dorian Gray in preparation for uh, for, for tonight. And um, it struck me uh, in reading um, the, the different characters. It seems to me that uh, um, he was writing by himself. Yes. You know, and um, and many of the characters manifest different um, aspects of him, like he's. Uh, conflict with himself. Uh, yeah, could you speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. A very perceptive question and I'm also very, very pleased you asked it because mm -hmm. I was hoping to address that in my talk but realized I didn't have time. So I love questions that allow you to add something to the talk that you wanted to say anyway. Yeah, the three main uh, uh, characters in the picture of Dorian Gray are the artist, Basil Hallward, um, uh, the, the, the protagonist, uh, Dorian Gray himself, and um, Lord Henry Watton. Uh, and uh, Wilde says somewhere, and I think it's evident, as you as you've very perceptively have, have uh, gleaned, that all those three characters are aspects of Wilde's own personality. So you have the artist, and the artist basically is, 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 is pure and is looking at the stars, uh, but perhaps he's, he's, he's guilty of uh, idolizing the subject too much, Dorian Gray. Um, but for the most part, he's, he's, he's good and he's ultimately martyred. <laughs> um, and then you have uh, Lord Henry Watton, who's the cynic, the critic. So, you know, Wilde is always oscillating between being the artist and the critic. Wilde as the artist is normally very Christian. Wilde as a critic is often iconoclastic. Um, so Lord Henry Watton's the critic. Uh, and, of course, uh, Dorian Gray is, is the person who's influenced by both art and criticism. Um, and the critic turns uh, Dorian Gray against art effectively because uh, the, the, the art is the work, is, 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 is the problem. The art, the art is something which is he learns to hate and, and indeed ultimately tries to destroy an, an, an act of iconoclasm. So the critic turns uh, the protagonist against art and the pu purpose of art, of course, is to reflect the truth. So in actual fact, the, 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 in, insofar as the picture of Dorian Gray can be seen as the, not just Basil Hallward's work of art, but as, as art or any work of art, we might be reminded of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's words in his famous lecture on fairy stories, um, that the uh, uh, purpose of fairy stories is to hold up a mirror of scorn and pity to man. 
So in other words, the, 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 one of the highest purposes of art is to show us ourselves. Uh, and that's what the picture does as a representative of art in the novel. Sir, um, now, oftentimes when Wilde is portrayed, uh, he's portrayed, if not technically an Englishman, at least as solidly and solely within the English literary tradition. Uh, but he comes from Ireland, and I was wondering, is there anything of the Irishman in him as a writer? Another great question. Um, I'm going to say something first because it's funny and sort of does um, it will get, get me to the point, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you know it much about T.S. Eliot. Does anybody know where T.S. Eliot was born? St. Louis, Missouri. Well, if, if you ever heard uh, recordings of T.S. Eliot speaking, he speaks with a much better English accent than I have. <laughs> and of course, he, he converts to uh, Anglo-Catholicism, to the Church of England, basically. And I think it was Jacques Maritain. I can never remember if it was Jacques Maritain or Etienne Jusson, but one of these great uh, neo-Thomists was asked, why, why did he think that T.S. Eliot never converted? Uh, and uh, Maritain or Jusson said, well, T.S. Eliot exhausted all of his powers of conversion when he became an Englishman. <laughs> but that does come in, play into this, because the point is, what sort of Irishman was Oscar Wilde? He was born in Ireland. In fact, I, would, uh, I haven't got to sell my book anymore, because apparently they're sold out, but uh, nonetheless, the, the first chapter is called Mother of Masks, and it looks upon, uh, uh, about the influence of Wilde's mother upon him. Um, and uh, how Irish were they? Because she was an Irish nationalist, but they were wealthy Protestant stock uh, that inherited most of their land because of supporting William of Orange uh, in the Battle of the Boyne in the, in the 1600s. So Chesterton writes about George Bernard Shaw as the anti-Irish Irishman. Uh, in other words, the, Shaw did not understand Catholic Ireland. Um, now, Wilde's conversion to Catholicism was really under the influence of Newman and Manning, and Pius the Ninth, um, and so I would say that it wasn't he was he, did, he didn't convert as an Irishman, and he hardly ever I think he only went back to Ireland once after leaving, um, maybe twice, but hardly ever. And the only time he spoke as an Irishman, and this is while wearing masks, he came to the United States. And his mother was well known because under her pen name of Speranza, she wrote some very well known Irish nationalist poems at the time. So, she, you know, Wilde was known as a celebrity, but the Irish Americans wanted to hear what Wilde thought about Ireland. So, as an act of loyalty to his mother, he sort of gave these quasi Irish nationalist talks, which, if anybody knows Oscar Wilde, he didn't give a proverbial damn about politics of any description. He was playing to his audience. He would get bigger crowds, uh, get paid more money, and get louder applause if he spoke about Ireland than if he spoke about art. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. We've got a question coming online from Carmen. She asked, Mr. Pierce, who does the character Basil symbolize in comparison to Oscar Wilde's life? He seems to be one of the few moral characters in the book Dorian Gray. Yeah, well, a bit of overlap, but basically Basil Hallward represents the artist in, in a, a somewhat altruistic fashion, and that's why Basil Hallward, I think, is one who uh, is portrayed as largely, largely innocent, although he, he is self-reproachful, but he certainly is a convert. I mean, at the end, in his final moments, um, he's calling for, for, uh, for, for the two of them to pray that their, their sins should be forgiven. Um, and then, of course, he's, he's martyred, so he, he, he dies a holy death. Um, but he signifies the, the, the good artist, the true artist, the artist as a, as a disciple of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Okay, I think you're off the hook at that point. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much.